Morton and Alexander, thank you both very, very much indeed for your excellent talks. And I think what I've um, uh, taken from that is that uh, post-traumatic stress disorder is, is a far more complicated and complex series of problems. It's not just a problem. There's a whole different, different layers of it um, manifesting themselves in all sorts of different ways, um, which clearly your research is trying to untangle. But... Equally, um, you've given us, I think, great sort of promise for what what might be how we might resolve this. Do you, do you yourselves feel optimistic that there are good treatments in the in the pipeline, and if you can kind of identify who might respond best to music therapy or who might respond best to psilocybin or or whatever, do you, do you, do you feel optimistic about treatments? I think we need to do more research. Of it's course, a kind of, of uh, course, yes. <laughs> and I, I definitely feel optimistic. I think there are now a number of things in the pipeline that I think, and I hope you, you've been convinced that there are potential there. Mm. I think what we really need is what we recently were given the opportunity by the DOD together with Yair to actually look at what happens when people first enter the military and then follow them for five years. And we're following a cohort of 500 people, and so that we can actually take into account the kind of trajectories that Alexander showed. What is it about that particular brain that means that you may be okay for the first, and then suddenly, mm -hmm. you know, things start? Or why does it in some individuals take 50 years before they finally, before, before the horrors of war really ca catch up with them? But no, I think, I'd like to think that there's hope to be optimistic. I mean, why else would we do it? <laughs> well, other than, uh, yes, obviously to, to, to find out these things, to discover the cause of it and, and what actually is going on in the brain is one thing, but then it has to translate into healthcare, doesn't it? And it has to find its way into the healthcare system. So what in your view, uh, I, and I don't know whether things are very different in, in Denmark, but what in your view should healthcare services be providing or at least be open to in order that your great research can be properly realized? Well, I think many people fear that it's sort of opening Pandora's box to start using psilocybin because um, it has been tried back in the 50s uh, in a not very controlled manner, which has put uh, a lot of strange videos on YouTube, but also some, some uh, quite uh, different results. Um, but, but I think it is something that is being sort of initial steps have been taken. Uh, now they've started to, to legalize uh, marijuana for, for certain things and, yes. and have put a lot of focus on that because there is, there is the option to change things. Um, and, and I think that's, uh, I mean, it, it, it would be crazy not to try and, and, and look into it. So some of these things that you mentioned, uh, it, it, is, uh, it is probably going to be uh, something that is going to be incorporated. Hopefully, Absolutely. and and you're finding that the, the the healthcare providers are at least open-minded to these these kind of um, potential think, therapies, are they? I mean, and again, uh, it may vary differently in Denmark to the UK, but uh, so as you know, we've 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 had a lot of. I mean, there's been a lot of wars, and a lot of people have suffered. In some countries like Israel and the US, there is a. A provision for healthcare for the veterans. In this country, it falls upon the NHS. And I think it could be time to maybe think about ways of, of helping with that. Hugh, my co-director of, of Scars of War, feels very strongly that this must happen. I mm -hmm. think we have a moral obligation to find ways of treating them. He tells me, when we discuss these things, he tells me about a friend of his who when he took the offer of actually recounting his experiences during the war to a group of, of like-minded people, or at least people that had trauma, even the therapist was in tear and tears. And so he felt that he was unable to share those things. So I think some of the horrors of war may not be well served by just having an NHS. Now, in this country, of course, we've also had a, a very strong tradition of giving and I think Help for Heroes is a wonderful example of how the British public has given a lot of money to what is essentially physical rehabilitation. And I think it's extremely important that we do something about the physical rehabilitation, about the limbs that are lost, and all those things. 
But I think it's also time that we think about how it is that we need to help with the mental, the invisible scars of war. I think it's time that we do the research and find out, and I think you're absolutely right not to get overbold by these preliminary results with, say, music or psychedelics, but to actually think about how it is that we can, we can really harness the power of research into treatments that are actually backed by evidence. And I think we need to do more. I'd love to do more studies in UK servicemen. Unfortunately, at this point in time, although we have MOD clearance, we are unable to do the study that we are now doing in Israel. And so I think it is very important that I think we perhaps rethink what it is that we do to those who put their lives for all of us. Mm. And I feel very strongly about that, and that's why we've set up the scars of war. Um, and I think most people would agree, but, you know, it's, it's a some difficult questions, and maybe we can talk about that later. And just before I um, uh, invite the audience to ask questions, I've, I've just got w one question for you, um, Alexander. It, this, the sense of smell and your work there, what, what kind of treatments might, do you think, might emerge from that? Well, I think we can, we can get to understand PhD better, yes. uh, because there is actually a very potent trigger of uh, getting these involuntary intrusive recollections in the scanner, so so by yeah. by stimulating them uh, under some uh, certain conditions, you could actually get a deeper understanding of what is actually going on, and that has also been done actually in uh, in several studies. So so the sense of smell can sort of be used to to get an understanding of both uh, what is going on yeah. after. Uh, the trauma, but also what is actually going on after the treatment. Yes. Um, so it can be sort of a marker of, of what functions best for, what, what works best for, for a certain individual. So would you sort of attempt to, and I'm, this is, you know, you may not be able to answer this if you're you know, still doing the research, of course, but, you know, is it a case of retraining the brain so it associates different smells with, you know, a, a something positive as opposed to something negative, or is it about erasing those those memories that are triggered by a particular smell. Well, as I as was clear in Morton's talk, was that mm. the the strategies are, are widely different, yeah. and and they're being used, and a lot of exciting results are coming in from sort of uh, all different directions. Uh, and I think at some point we need to try and merge these to get the understanding to answer your question. Great. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Right, well, I'm sure um, you've got, to, there's lots of questions. So there's a couple of um, microphones here. And who, now there's the bright light there, so I can't actually see you. Oh, yes, I can if I do that. All right. <laughs> <laughs> People in the top row at the back there. So who's, who's got a question, first of all? OK, the lady, lady here. Do you have any idea, in a given cohort going into a similar battle zone, for example, how many of those people suffer from PH PTSD? I mean, what, so, are, what are the sort of percentages? Mm, yeah, I, I should have given those percentages, but they are slightly... Um, I mean, so, if you ask the Americans, or the Israelis, or the Danish, they would say that there's about 10 to 13 percent of those who go into battle, 13. 10 to 13 percent that will suffer from PTSD, at least in the way that we measure it. For some reason, the English numbers come out much lower than that, for reasons that are not fully understood. But it's also clear that mm, things may have been underreported. But it's a bona contention. But let's just say that it's between about 10 percent. So it's a fairly large number. The big question, of course, then becomes how much of that is caused by mild traumatic brain injury? So people falling off lorries or, you know, heading their head in IEDs, and how much of that is actually the psychological experiences and the expectations and the kinds of... I mean, as I was listening to Alexander talking, I almost felt that kind of knot in my stomach, thinking, now I have to go out on patrol. I know that there was a roadside bombing there last... yesterday. Um, so I think those are important questions, but we're talking about a really quite substantial problem, and, and some people would even say that the number are much higher than that. So these are just sort of perhaps just the tip of the iceberg. Thank you. I, yes, question here. Um, uh, um, the research into unconscious, I mean, a few years back, I didn't believe in an unconscious mind. Now it's, it's, it's a peripheral part of psychology. Yeah. Um, 
I mean, could you train them? Could you train the brain? In the, we haven't got that far, I understand, but um, hypnosis, could that train a, a person to become more vigilant in battle? Um, so, I mean, let's, let's perhaps first clear the thing about the unconscious mind, whatever it is. Um, it's very clear that there are things going on underneath the surface that we are not aware of. Um, a classic problem in emotion is a problem that was posed by William James, namely that when you are running away from a bear, are you feeling afraid because you're feeling your heartbeat? Or is it because you see the bear that you start running away? And of course, sometimes we find ourselves in situations where we suddenly have a stress reaction and we have no way of knowing. The classic example in social psychology is one where they basically ask somebody to stand in front of a Rigachi bridge or on the Rigachi bridge. And it ha she happened to be quite an attractive young woman. And she would ask fairly inane questions to people that then had to cross that bridge. And as they came to the other side, they asked people, after they had questioned them on the things that whether they had any retention of what they've heard, they asked them, how attractive did you find that young woman? And it turned out that the ones that had met her on the Rigachi bridge, where there had been a lot of sort of commotion in their stomach found her much more attractive than the one that had met her before, <laughs> showing perhaps the influence of the unconscious mind or of the body and the way that it changes the mind. So as I showed you with the connectum harmonics, it's very clear that at any one time there are lots and lots of things going on in our brain and we have very little insight to what it is that's going on. To what extent we can use hypnosis to actually guide that, to change that, to become either more or less vigilant, because of course the question becomes, should you be hypervigilant? Are the ones that in fact are able to cope most are the ones that are not hypervigilant about I And I kept looking at that IED and thinking, I, could I have seen that? And I'm sure, you know, had you been in that particular accident with the little trigger, you, you would constantly then start to see things that were perhaps not there. And sometimes, and it's been shown very clearly that if you can change people's attention, and the way that they direct the attention, which of course is exactly what the music therapy task is doing, you can actually change the way that people think about in the situation. So whether we need hypnosis, hypnosis I'm not sure. Thank you. Another question. A question there, gentlemen in the... You mentioned the focus program in the US to do with involving families with uh, PTSD sufferers. Could you expand on that? Yeah, no, I was hoping somebody would ask about that. That's not a planted question, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so Patricia Lester has been very interested, from a family point of view, to think about what it is to have secondary traumas. What, is, what are the impacts on a family when f dad or mom goes off on, a, on, say, a tour of six months and they come back? And so she's developed a program where she basically has a a way of getting the whole family together and each of them giving, and in some cases they use a th thermometer, so they indicate their stress level as they go through this deployment. And so a bit like the kind of um, the canneries in the, in the coal mine, it turns out that the kids are actually a very good indicator of what might possibly, how it is that dad, and most of the time, and there's some very powerful evidence coming out now where you, they're asking, say, the father who's been on mission, and he would deny that there's any problem, but you ask the family, and they know that there's a problem. And there's some very powerful ways in which you can then get people to actually start something as simple as talking about it. Man really is man's medicine. Now, in the program, they're trying to have, give everybody a voice. And one of the things that is coming back over and over again, and it was one of the things I think that came out very strongly when they initially trialed this on the SEALs, was that by having this from those that you love, by having them express not so much concern about what it is that you are, what it is that you do, but talk about what it is that it's doing to everyone. It turns out that people are then willing to have the kind of help that then hopefully will avoid giving the kinds of symptoms that could be much harder later on. And remember what I showed you earlier, the real key thing here is to avoid to go from acute to chronic. And if you can do that, it's much, much easier to try to stop that transition there than once you have got the chronic version of actually trying then to fix it. 
And so that's really what that program is doing. And one of the things we're hoping to do in this country is to, because it's a, a range of different things that they're doing to these families, we would like to find out what are the things that actually works and what of them are culturally dependent because of course they have a very different cycle of deployment in the US, it's, it's a year in most places for instance, and what it is that we need to do to adapt it to the kinds of deployment cycles we have in this country. Alexander, would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, I think just adding in the family is, is also uh, of signif extreme significance. Um, I had a very, very close friend of mine, uh, and we talked about everything. He, was, he has also been deployed, um, so we could talk openly. It wasn't a structured kind of talk. We would, we would still be sort of having like his soldiers chatter and laugh a bit about some of the things, so, but, but still talk openly about it. And it wasn't until many years later that I actually found out he'd had suicidal ideations. And I was completely blown away. I had no idea. Um, so, so having these structured approaches to try and figure out uh, are there any red flags uh, and doing it uh, in a very systematic manner uh, I think is very important. Did he actually tell you afterwards why he hadn't told you at the time? Was it, again, just... It's still taboo. I mean, yeah. it's still... Uh, Even though you were close friends. I mean, often it's something that you go from the acute phase, and then at some point it is chronic. But but some of the changes are also like quite normal. Being afraid of... Uh, or being extra alert when there is a something that resembles an explosion mm -hmm. is something that I think everyone... Everyone knows who's, who's been deployed. Um, but So that's one thing that's changed. Many of the, the, the people who are being sent out, they're 19, 20 years old, they say, I came out a boy, came home a man. Um, so something changed. But is it, is it growing up? Or is it the brain growing in the wrong direction? And that's actually sort of one of the things that is worth trying to disentangle is what is actually a good progression, what is a, what is a bad progression. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think for someone to try and figure that out on your own whilst having difficulty talking to someone about it, whilst um, actually reliving uh, some of the things um, is something that is extremely difficult. Mm. Yes, I see that. Right, questions. There's a lady here. I'm sorry, am I missing anybody at the back? Are there any hands up at the back? Yes, OK, fine. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Um, I'm actually an academic at the Institute of Psychiatry and Mental Health Programme. And one of my project students at the moment is looking at the role of attention in anxiety, specifically generalised anxiety, but comparing it to PTA, um, PTSD and <coughs> other types of anxiety. So what she's looking at is attention bias compared to, say, avoidant, being avoidant to fear, fear relevant stimuli. And I was looking at the, the task that you put up about gazing and music. And so what you're actually doing there is encouraging avoidant behavior, would you say, to fear relevant stimuli? Um, we certainly try to uh, make them not look at the negative stimuli, yeah. yes. So I'm just interested so this, this was social anxiety, so the, the yes, AGB, yeah, yeah, which is was. different from generalised anxiety. Absolutely, yeah, I agree. Um, and but in I fact, with PTSD, uh, as far as I know, they use the angry faces. So they use neutral and angry, and they try to not make them look at the angry faces, and that seems to be the best combination. Yeah, but so, so it's more that my project student is looking at the difference between intentional bias and yeah. then being avoidant. And I was just interested more in the outcome of that study and how you think it translates to PTSD. Um, I, I suppose more just sort of to bring take information back to my project student. Yeah. But and just in terms of what sort of behaviour are you training somebody in if they're... If, um, being avoidant to fear relevant stimuli can be an issue in anxiety disorders. And if you're actually encouraging that, then it's sort of what, do you see what I mean? That can be sort of an incongruent. Yeah, I, I think it's, I mean, we can certainly talk more about it and I, I can give you the relevant papers because I think you, there you'll find a lot of the evidence. Um, I think you are definitely retraining the way that you are processing the world. And Depending on your pathology, there will be different things that you probably need to attend less or to attend more to. In social anxiety, it's very clear from the results 
that you have to avoid looking at negative information, and in this case, disgusted faces. Uh, it doesn't work that well with angry faces, for instance, so it really is very important what it is. It's also very clear that it's social stimuli that you should be worried about. But of course, that again depends on what kind of anxiety you have. And here we are talking about social anxiety, so it's about social stimuli. Generalized anxiety, of course, there could be anxieties about all sorts of things, right? I think the key principle here is just that you have a way that is rewarding that allows you to retrain the way that you are laying down the tracks. The job for us researchers is to try every one combination and find out what it is that really needs. And to somehow it's a bit like flying in blind, you know. You have some theories about what might be going on and what should be going on. And more than very often, as you know, we, we are wrong about our you know, ideas about what it is that is working or not working. But then we have to be open to the results. I think what excites me about the task is not so much the actual specifics of whether it's one or the other phase, but the idea that you're working for something positive. Because I think this is something that shows very clearly in my work. The kind of things you do because you're motivated to do them, the kinds of things you do because you are rewarded to do them. The reason why we get up in the morning is because today there could be dancing. Today there could be joy. It's not because I'm afraid that I will get whipped again. You know, life will kick me down. And I think that is what that task does. And it's not boring, because a lot of the attention modulation tasks in the literature are very, very boring. And so you sometimes wonder when you're sitting there for hours on end, is this an effect of me being bored, or is it an effect of me actually changing the way I work? And so I think that's probably why it works, but I, I'd be very happy to talk to you, and to your student, of course, as well. Now, over here, okay, two questions. <laughs> Hi, I'm very interested to know whether either of you have come across anything that might suggest a connection or um, a connection between larium and PTSD and whether that might be considered as a risk factor. Alexander, in turn. No, no, I haven't. <laughs> uh, I, I'm not too familiar with that literature. Um, no, I know that there's, there's, um, there's certainly some intriguing links although I think the evidence is still out, linking it to various mental disorders, including depression. Um, but it's difficult to know, really. I, I don't think I, I could, other than speculate. Yes, please. You talked about um, uh, Denmark and Israel having national service. Do you see a difference in incidence of PTSD between countries like Denmark and Israel and places here, for example, where it's not a sort of social obligation to join the army? So that would be a natural kind of uh, reaction, right? But the problem is that in the US, of course, it's not a national service anymore, at least. And there the numbers are much more like Denmark and, and Israel and the rest of the world where we measure those things. So I'm still puzzled by this. Um, I, I'm not quite sure. It could be to do with the way that we decide that we put the thresholds up. There's a, a very large debate in Lancet going on a few years back. I, I think the, the evidence is that it's probably more like 10 to 15 rather than the, the five that is usually quoted for the UK population. There's also been some incidences in Denmark where uh, they've been, soldiers have been diagnosed with PTSD from a, a psychiatrist and then uh, when they applied to get uh, so the, the social benefits that follows from the Ministry of Defense, uh, they were given an answer saying, no, you don't have PTSD, based on paperwork and not uh, an interview. So, so there are a lot of strange things going on with the PTSD diagnosis, and also I think there is a lot of difference from the soldier's perspective on uh, when to act upon it, um, how much focus there is on PTSD. So PTSD awareness, I think is uh, is extremely important in this uh, in this discussion as well. And I, th I think it's important also to say that it's not about being weak. In many ways, PTSD is a natural response to an unnatural set of events. And I think really, and this is why I feel so strongly and why we've agreed to do this today, is that really it needs to be in the public awareness, and much more so. And I think we need to really talk about the psychological effects of war, of trauma, and not just worry about the kind of things we can see, but talk about the invisible pain. And I think by doing so, I, I hope we would actually be able to transform lives. And it wasn't until 1980 that you actually uh, acknowledged that it was 
an outside event, that it was a trauma that caused it and not uh, an innate weakness. Um, so that was a, a major difference. So of course now this talk about filling the glass and I mean it is it is an area where you have to sort of tiptoe your way around uh, because there are a lot of emotions and a lot of, of people who are uh, sort of uh, have very strong opinions about what it is and what it isn't. Okay, this question up there. Uh, this is a question for Alexandra about the olfactory triggers, which I found really interesting. So the ones you mentioned were all olfactory triggers associated with harmful events, so gunpowder, burnt flesh. And I was wondering if you looked at olfactory triggers, so that things that were associated with a period in the army or in a war zone, but that might in themselves be harmless, like, for example, a particular smell of the uniform or I don't know if there was specific diesel that was yeah. used in the car. So did you look, did, can those cause the same, can those be a trigger as well or does it have to be harmful the, uh, things so associated with no, harmful Normally things? with smells, um, from the age of 5 to 15, uh, you, you have the first smell that you have an emotional experience with. They just burn into your brain. And then every time you smell that perfume of that uh, girl you saw that uh, walking by and she was in a dress for the first time, that you found that to be amazing, uh, you can remember that or the smell of your grandmother's apartment. Or So people have these different, very vivid memories. But then after the age of 15, you've smelled a lot of things a lot of times. So it, it's mostly when you have a very high emotional state and... Uh, a certain smell at the same time that these two merge in the brain. Um, so um, these these other smells of everyday things like diesel, or, it, it, it doesn't have the same effect. No. But yet I think it's also important, and in fact we've set up a thing called the Flavor Institute in Denmark, where we're interested in thinking about the positive things, because of course flavors, and that mostly means smells, are really triggers of well-being. And of course, it stands to reason, although we haven't done it yet, that you could potentially desensitize them to these odors, but also bring other odors in that yeah. could potentially change. And especially, I mean, many, many people walk around not enjoying the things that really should be enjoying. We've been very interested in, in the older population and finding ways of actually making them taste things, to actually make them enjoy the kind of flavorings. And I think that is the kind of work that could potentially also be used with the PTSD. Cohort. Question there. Thank you. It's um, all very fascinating. Morton, you just said now that um, PTSD is a normal reaction to an abnormal situation, which was a thought in my own mind. And um, Alexander, uh, you know, one feels that it would be a good thing to help soldiers not to um, experience it, to protect them against it, to find some way of selecting those who are vulnerable, treating them beforehand to, in a preventive way. But then I'm thinking to myself, well, if you do that, are you inuring soldiers to the violence that they, that they may see? Um, as happens with um, the ISIS um, soldiers. Um, and, uh, you know, is it almost that it's a protective mechanism that it will take you out of the theatre, um, that somehow or other it's protecting the brain from further trauma? That's a very good question. It, it, it might be, but I mean, it is, it is a matter of, of being, um, it, it, for many, it's a, permanent, it's a permanent thing. So it might take them out of the immediate danger, but it also disables them in, in returning to the life that they want to live. And, and um, so it is a matter of, it is a, it is a brain mechanism. Of course it is. Um, and like Morton said before, um, it is a matter of, of it seems to be a matter of, of people filling their glass and then at some point it's just enough. Um, so 
the, the level of trauma, childhood trauma, trauma during deployment, uh, post-deployment trauma, um, at some point, sort of the brain has had enough and says, okay. Um, so in that manner, it seems to be sort of uh, in some sort of spectrum of uh, a normal reaction because so many people have it. We have 13% of, of, of Danish soldiers who have PTSD or uh, have an, a high enough score on the PTSD uh, sc scoring list to, to actually get the diagnosis if they uh, went for it. Yeah. Certainly, I mean, people obviously have been thinking about whether they could make soldiers that didn't suffer from that. That would be quite useful, right? A universal soldier that could just kill without any kind of repercussions. As far as I know, and I know the literature quite well, it's never really happened. Because we are emotional beings that, you know, for better or worse, are very dependent on other people. We like being with other people. Man really is man's medicine. Um, and so it is a natural reaction. I think it is unnatural to kill other people. Uh, I think most of us could agree with that. And so how does one then resolve that? We can't stop all war. So we have to at least help those who suffer, I think. Yes, one more question here. Got time for, I think, just one, one final question. Hello, I was just wondering what your opinion is of EMDR, which has been a long-standard um, potential therapy for PTSD. So the, um, the evidence is quite good when it's deployed immediately, um, but long-term long -term outcomes of EDMR doesn't seem to be all that significant. Um, I think still it's important that we try. And it, we don't know exactly which individuals will be helped and which won't, but it's clearly changing the attentional mechanisms. I like to think that we could do better this is why I shown the musical therapy and why you know other people have been thinking about how it is that we can harness the attention. So, yeah, I think we certainly should be able to do better. And one of the things that my research is dedicated to is to find better ways of doing things. At the same time, I think one shouldn't really just stop doing things because there's a bit of a noise. Closing comments from each of you. Is there anything you would just like to say, just to sum up, or final thoughts for the audience? What I, I don't know, Alexander. You <laughs> no, I just, Sorry, I put I you on the spot there. It's, uh, <laughs> it's uh, absolutely amazing that, that people have such a big interest in this and also are willing to discuss it, uh, because that is basically uh, what needs to be to, to bring us forward, uh, because there is so much more to to be learned about this in order to understand the underlying mechanisms before we can really start to, to get uh, uh, value for the buck when doing the treatments. We've, we've focused a lot on the military experience here, which is because, it, unfortunately, there are lots of wars and it's very easy to get to those. In your opening remarks, you talked about all those others that actually suffer, and I think it's important to remember that in war, it's mostly the civilians that really suffer, and yet those are the ones we are not really getting to. We're not really looking at their brains. And I think that is really one thing that I would like to do. I would like to understand, not just in war zones, but in general, what it is that, how it is that we make that transition from an acute stress, from an acute pain into something chronic. Can we stop that? Can we find ways of identifying and predicting who are, are more likely to develop some of this? In the absence of stopping wars and stopping traumas altogether, can we find a way of stopping that trajectory? If I was to say that that is where I would like to be in five years, that's probably where I'd like to be. Find ways of increasing well-being in a sort of Benthium manner, right? More happiness to more people. Not just happiness in the absence of, of pain, but actually finding ways of not making them develop that, that trauma, of enjoying the everyday things that still makes it worth being around. On that note, thank you both very, very much indeed. And thank you to all of you for all your great questions. It's been a really excellent session. Thank you very much indeed. I hope you've all enjoyed the evening as well. Thank you.